Thanks for listening to this teaching from City of Life Church. Check out www.col.tv for more great teachings, service times, and information on upcoming events. Now, let's join the service already in progress. Okay, well, I'm on week two of a series that we just started called Where Hope Lives. And in this series, Where Hope Lives, I'm going through at the beginning of 2020, our church vision statement, and I'm kind of breaking down the reason that we have that particular vision statement. I know that could sound, you know, like, oh, great. What, what, why do I want to hear a vision statement? Well, it's more than just a vision statement for us. There's some really deep core values and principles that are in here that I believe in order to be the kind of member that God has called you to be in this local church, it would really help you uh, to understand this, help you to be a better member. Uh, to, to understand what, what we're trying to accomplish here. So turn with me to Acts chapter 2, verses 38 through 47. I'm going to read about the early church, uh, the first church uh, that ever existed. And we're going to kind of contrast uh, their church with our church, see how we can find some parallels. Uh, before I do, I'll just touch real quick on Acts chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. It says, in those days, this is after the resurrection of Jesus, uh, right as Jesus is a, has ascended uh, to the Father, the church is kind of left here to, you know, wait on the Holy Spirit uh, to be given. And at that time, it says, in those days, Peter stood among the believers, a group numbering about 120. Okay, so this building seats around 1,000. So you can imagine just sort of estimating how many people are in this room uh, right now. This is way more people in this room right now than were in the original church that Peter started with, 120. So I would like you, as we read our text, Acts chapter 2, verses 38 through 47, to think in mind what, what, what about 120 people would be. Okay, so it says, this is now after the Holy Spirit moves in the upper room and people get filled with the Holy Spirit, begin to speak in other tongues, other languages, people are hearing them speak in other languages. There are like little fireballs on top of people's head. It's like a, it, it's, it's an amazing supernatural thing. The power of the Holy Spirit is moving. People are, that speak languages that they don't speak are hearing them speak in tongues, but they're understanding it in their own language. Multiple people that spoke different language heard one person talking, but each of them understood in their own language. And the power of God is moving in such a huge way. Peter steps up after this happens and preaches a message to all these unbelievers. And it says, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So he's saying what you've just seen here, this is not just for us. Anybody that's willing to accept Christ has the ability to receive the same power. By the way, that's still true today. The, this prom, the promise is for you and, and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Verse 41, those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. Can you imagine going from 120 to 3,000 in one day? The church growing exponentially, almost instantly, through one message, the church goes from 120 to 3,000. That is huge. Everyone say, huge. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who has need, who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. I love this model that we see of the first church. No one's giving them a manual on how to do church. They're meeting together in the temple courts, thousands now of people. They've, they've outgrown their capacity. Some historians and theologians believe that the church eventually got to 50,000 people. So. What are they doing? It says they started having small groups. They started doing other locations like Nona and Colso. They started meeting in other places, in other parts of the city where people lived too far to be able to come to temple so that they could expand. 
I love the fact too that it says in verse 47, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to the, their number daily. How often did he add? Come on, how often did he add? Those who are being saved. I love that. I love the fact that people are getting saved even when there's no church. Come on, look at somebody next to you and say, you are the church. Come on, put your hand on your heart and say, I am the church. Can I tell you something today? This is not the church. This stage that I'm on, that screen up there, this microphone, the, 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 the gym, the, the kids facilities, that's not the church. That reader board that's out front that says City of Life, that's not the church. We are the church. Together, corporately, we are the ones that Jesus died for. Jesus didn't die for buildings. He died for his people. And he came to redeem his people and to bring us together. When we get that and understand that the church is supposed to be the church on Monday through Saturday also, you know what's gonna happen? He's gonna daily add to the number. We won't see salvations just in this room at the end of an altar call. We will see salvations in our job, in our workplace, in our homes, at the gas station, at the mall, everywhere we go, we will see lives transformed. Why? Because we are the church. And that's what I love about this early model of, of the church and the way it continued growing. So today, I'm gonna to talk about part two of where hope lives. I'm gonna focus on the part of our vision statement that says by building a large Christ-centered church, transforming culture through creativity. Father, we thank you for your presence and your goodness. Uh, I thank you for every person that is in this room today. I thank you for every person that is at City of Life South Orlando, every person that is watching online or listening to a podcast right now. Uh, I thank you that you are moving in each of our lives. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you want to be our counselor. You want to lead us and to teach us uh, and instruct us. And I pray that in, in Jesus' name, our hearts would be opened to, to receive the truth of your word, even when it hurts. Uh, teach us today. Let us leave this message different than the way we walked into it. We ask you to change us and work on us and grow us to look more like Jesus today. In your name we pray, Lord. And everybody said, amen. So at City of Life, here is the, the, the vision. To make the hope of Jesus known by building a large Christ-centered church, transforming culture through creativity, and empowering ordinary people to lead others and live dynamically for the cause of God's kingdom. Last week, I focused on the part of the vision statement that says to make the hope of Jesus known. And we said, well, what is the hope of Jesus? And really, we got into the fact that the hope of Jesus differs from human hope, just simple, normal hope that is derived in our psyche or psychological hope, like whimsical hope, like, oh, I hope I get her phone number. That's not Jesus, the hope of Jesus. Uh, or, 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 you know, I hope it's not raining today. That, that's whimsical hope. Uh, but, but then we also have kind of a deeper level of human hope that would be more like desperate hope. Like if you're, you know, rock climbing and you get your foot stuck and no one can come rescue you and your phone is dead and you got to stay, you know, with your foot stuck for like three days until rescuers find you. I think there's a level of hope that if you don't have a certain type of hope, I, I just heard about a guy that was stranded, uh, you know, up in the the woods and I think in the Seattle area and it was cold outside and he lived for like nine days with no food or water and was eating snow. You have to have like some level of hope to be able to continue. There's a hope that's derived in the human will uh, that is not a negative thing. It's, it's a positive thing, but we're not talking about that kind of hope. The hope of Jesus is something different. It's transcendent. It's based on who he is. It is the fact that he has already done everything that needs to be done for our eternal salvation. That we can have hope in the worst of situations that nothing is ever over when it comes to Jesus. That Jesus doesn't give on peop, up on people. He doesn't give up on situations. He gives us hope from our past, in our present, and for our future. Can somebody say amen today if you're in the house? That's what the hope of Jesus is. The hope of Jesus means that we can go to people that are broken. 
And we can just let his love show through us in such a way that they get encouraged and believe, hey, maybe there's hope for me in this situation after all. So the hope of Jesus is something that we live uh, to see in our lives, in our families, in our business. But at City of Life, we want to make the hope of Jesus known. And here's how we do that. And, and, and we get into this this week, part two, is by building a large Christ-centered church and transforming culture through creativity. So today, let's think about that for a second. By building a, it doesn't just say by building a Christ-centered church. Uh, and, and I could, you know, if I look at this with sort of a critical eye and say, okay, why does it, why does the language read like this? Why does it have to say a large Christ-centered church? Why can't it just say by building a Christ-centered church? Then whoever shows up, shows up. If it's large, if it's small, if you're Christ-centered, you don't really care too much. I can understand that line of reasoning, but I do think there's some reasoning as to why it says by building a large Christ-centered church. Uh, number one, as we started off, you know, I, I read a text scripture about the way the early church grew exponentially. And I think it's pretty powerful that when the Holy Spirit is moving and God is doing incredible things and people's lives are being changed and touched, that I think that is something that is attractive. I think the message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus, it's not a small message. It is a big message. It's a message that deserves to be heard by many, many people. I think that many times it starts on a personal level. And the greatest space for us to communicate our faith is one-on-one -on -one with people. But I believe when people on the outside see a group of people that God is moving in their life in a dynamic way, I think that we have a tendency to want to lean and go, what is that all about? Why are those people acting like that? Why are they worshiping? Why are they praising God? Why are they getting together every week? I think there is something very attractive about about that. And I think that when people saw the power of God in Acts chapter 2, they saw the power of the Holy Spirit moving. Peter jumped up and moved to the middle and took the stage and preached a message. 3,000 people were saved instantly. I think in Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 through 25, it says, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease. Somebody say every disease. Who believes he can heal every disease today? Come on, all campuses, raise your hand and shake it in the air if you believe that our God can heal every disease. Hey, I'm going to tell you something. Over the last year, we've heard so many testimonies of people being healed in this church, of cancer, of all kinds of, I mean, disease I've never even heard of before. Things for which there is no medical cure for that you're not supposed to be able to get over. We've seen people healed of AIDS in this church. We've seen people's bodies click back together when things were broken and, and, and broken bones take place. We've seen marriages healed. We've seen people set free from addictions. Just got a letter this week about somebody who had a drastic change of heart. They were living a particular way and God got a hold of them. They sent us a testimony, made our entire staff cry as we were reading it on Tuesday. And it was God alone that did it. Can I get an amen from somebody? The power of God is still alive and moving and working. He's doing miracles today. Even in this letter, someone said, I had literally a demonic spirit that was tormenting me for years and I felt a release and now I am completely healed in Jesus name. So, so we're still seeing the power of God move as it's talked about here in scripture. It says news spread about him all over Syria and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, demon possessed, those having, excuse me, those having seizures, the paralyzed, and he healed them. Can I tell you something? Well, you've got friends that have troubles and problems. You need to say, get to church with me. You need to come to church with me. God is moving. And I believe that we have a God that can heal your situation. When you see people that are broken and sick and hurting, you need to say, do whatever you can do to get in this atmosphere. Who believes that even in an atmosphere of worship that people can be healed? I don't even think you have to get to the preaching in order for someone to be healed. I think people can, you know what? I've heard people say, you know, I walked into your church and I felt accepted. They said that, that's something from that letter. I walked in the, in the church and I felt accepted. People hugged me and welcomed me and something just broke in my life the moment I walked into the door. You know what that is? That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why we want to get people in the room. Just look at someone that you say, just get in the room. Sometimes you just got to get in the room. You don't know how your healing's going to happen. You may have these big plans. You can say, I can see it right now. I'm sitting on the, the second row and Pastor Jeff points right at me and says, stand up. And, and I, I've got a word for you. I mean, you may think, who knows, man, some little old lady in the parking lot might put her arms around you. You might get healed of that thing that's been following you around for a year. You don't know how it's going to look. 
Just get there. But all I know is that in Matthew 4, it says they were bringing people to Jesus. They were bringing them from everywhere. Demon possessed, seizures, paralyzed. He healed them. Verse 25 says large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis. What is the Decapolis? That's 10 cities that were near Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, all those uh, Israel cities. But 10 cities, the Decapolis, were Greek and Roman cities that were non-believers, secular cities, the center of Greek and Roman culture, totally unsaved people, huge crowds of unsaved people that knew nothing about Judaism, knew nothing about Christianity, all they knew is there's this guy named Jesus and huge crowds started following him around. From, from there, from Jerusalem, Judea, the regions across Jordan, they were all following him. Why? They were attracted to the power of God. They were attracted to something that is real. What am I trying to do here today? I'm trying to tell you that the reason at City of Life that we talk about a large Christ-centered church is because God has given us a heart to reach a lot of people. We want to reach every community in Central Florida. We want to reach every community in Osceola County. We want to reach as many people as we can possibly reach with the message of hope that Jesus... Is anyone on board with me here today? That Jesus is big enough. That Jesus is kind enough. He's good enough. He loves you enough. He created you. He fashioned you. We want as many people as possible to hear this message. And look, I'll say it like this. There's nothing wrong with a small church. My dad uh, and my mom grew up in denominations where there just were no big churches. Uh, I think the biggest church in those denominations were probably around 250 people. And that's a denomination that had... A, millions of people in it. So these churches were not large churches. There were just a lot of them all over the world. And my dad pastored many churches in that organization. Uh, you know, and his churches were actually some of the largest ones in the denomination. And once it got big enough, the, you know, they would send him to a tiny one to sort of punish him uh, because they didn't really like the fact that he preached to anyone that showed up. Uh, he wouldn't kick people out of his church because they were divorced. And he wouldn't kick people out of his church because they had tattoos. They wouldn't kick people out of their church because they were perfect. He was like that even in the 70s. You've always been a rebel, Dad. I love that about you. That's what's so good about my dad. He's great. Come on. How about Pastor Gary over here? Dr. Gary. He just, he just kept preaching. So they'd say, oh, really? Well, we'll send you to Kansas then. Let's see how, if, what you can do there. I mean, and there's like 40 people in this church, and they were having three or four services, 500 people. They said, oh, well, then we're going to send you to Alabama. They just did all this stuff. So eventually he just left. And, and uh, God, you know, the, the, you're going to find out about this story uh, soon. I'm not going to tell you how, but it's going to be a movie. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, anyways, so in, in, his, in his story, he bounces around, does all this different things. Look, the size of the church, it's not significant in terms of pleasing God. That's not the important thing. You can have a small church where the gospel's preached, people are being saved, lives are being changed, and God will be pleased. You can have a small church, and God can be totally pleased with that. And let me tell you something. This is important to know, too. You can also have a large church where the gospel is not being preached properly, it can grow bigger and bigger even though the gospel is not being preached properly, even though people are doing it for the wrong reasons. And I would even venture to say that some of the reasons that certain churches are so big is they preach a gospel that caters to what people want to hear rather than what God has to say about our lives. I don't want a church like that either. So, so there, there's two things to know right there, but here's the third thing that's really important to know as well. And this is what I want to get at today with who we are. Uh, you can also have a large church where the gospel is preached. People are being saved, lives are being changed, and God can still be pleased. And we feel that God has called us to that. Why? Because we've seen it in our hearts. And I, I guess one way that I would have to explain this is some of it has to do with vision. It has to do with the heart of the people that God has called uh, to lead. And, and I would say this. Have you ever been to a restaurant that is a small restaurant that had really good food. Raise your hand if you've ever been to a small restaurant that the food was so banging that you would stand in line to wait to get in, okay? You know the kinds I'm talking about? And there's only one of them. They don't have multiple locations, they got one. 
Okay, now have you ever, it, I'm, I'm talking the food is so good that you're like, oh girl, they gonna be on diners, drive-ins, and dives soon. This place is gonna be on the Food Network before long. I'm telling you, I'm glad we're here first. You know, you, like, you, you get exci- like you, you're excited to be in the room. But then you get in there and you're, you're sitting down eating the food and it's so good and you look at the person next to you like, this place is so small, why don't they expand? You turn into like this genius entrepreneur. They can knock this wall out and add like, and you're sitting there thinking to yourself, how come? But isn't it interesting, I can think of a lot of those types of restaurants that are still small. And they've been packing people in there for 20, 30 years, never expanded, never knocked a wall out. Never did anything like that. Why? Because the people who owned it, that wasn't really in their heart. That wasn't their vision. They wanted to have a place that was packed all the time. They wanted to have good food that they serve consistently. They don't want to worry about franchising and buying new places and do all that. They just want to have a good thing. And you know what? No one can fault the owner. No one can fault the visionary of that place for choosing to do what they do. Okay? And in the same way, I know, you know, my dad, like I said, pastored a lot of churches like that. But here we are. We're in Central Florida. We're in a place where we feel like there's a lot of opportunity to reach broken people. And we believe that God has called us to have a large Christ-centered church. I think there's a lot of reasoning uh, that I've given you through scripture. We can find a biblical precedent that when things are exciting, that there's, you know, people want to be a part of it. So it's, it's just kind of who we are. So a large Christ-centered church. Uh, I think that's the most important part. It doesn't matter if it's large, if it's not Christ-centered. Can I get an Amen. Okay, it doesn't matter how much money you make in life if you're not Christ-centered. It doesn't matter how many family members you have if your family is not Christ-centered. Can I get an amen from somebody? We have to be Christ-centered. So what does Christ-centered mean? Well, in a nutshell, it means Jesus first, Jesus always. That's what Christ-centered means. It means that Jesus comes first in my life. Jesus is the beginning point of everything I do. And as a, as a church, as an organization, it has to begin with Jesus. It all has to start with Jesus. I mean, it has to begin with him. It has to end with him. Jesus has to be our cause. He has to be our hope. He has to be the reasoning. Like if we can't figure out how it relates to Jesus as a church, we shouldn't be doing it. Can I get an amen from somebody? So, but if it has to do with Jesus and we can give Jesus the glory by doing it, we're going to do it. Okay, we're going to do things that give Jesus glory, that, that promote who he is and who he wants to be in our community. We have to make sure that we are Christ-centered, that everything comes back to Jesus. Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17 says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, Song from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Wasn't that fun earlier when we lifted our hands and praised the Lord together and we sang together? It says, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Somebody say, whatever you do, whether word or deed, do it in the name of Jesus. Come on, look at somebody next to you say, do it in the name of Jesus. Look at him and say, eat that smash burger in the name of Jesus. Boy, last night I, was, I had that smash burger. There were all these healthy people in that, that bole, and I, I brought my smash burger in there, and the employees started looking at me. They, they could smell it. They knew it was evil. I sat it down right on the thing with a big smile on my face. I was eating with all my friends who were eating the bole food. And then I ate and it was terrible because uh, one of our volunteers that's over there, she is so sweet. Uh, she came up as she was leaving. She was sitting on the other side of the room. She goes, Pastor Jeff, uh, I was just going to tell you something. She goes, man, I, I watched you eat that cheeseburger. Um, you ate the whole thing in four bites. Uh, she was like, you, that was incredible. I just want to tell you that was really incredible. I said, well, didn't you hear me preach? Do everything you do as unto the Lord Jesus Christ. I said, I'd, I'd crush that thing. <laughs> It was at least six bites. Come on, don't be so hard on me. But you know, it's kind of funny to say that, but the truth is, really, 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 in life, living a Christ-centered life means whatever you do. Whatever you do, when you're with your friends, when, when you're celebrating, when you're having a good time, when you're working, when you're mourning, uh, when you're doing your exercise, doing your workout, whatever those daily things are that we do that can tend to be meaningless, what it's saying, do it, for Jesus. 
do it. Can I get an amen from somebody? Do it as unto the Lord. Do it with purpose. Make everything you do Christ-centered. And here's a good way to tell if, if it's really Christ-centered or not. Can Jesus be involved in it? Can you invite him to that part of your life? Or do you have to go, hey, Jesus, can you give me one hour until I binge watch this show? I've only got one more episode. Can you just hang out over there for an hour? Just one hour. That's the last one. Then you can hang out with me. If you've got to compartmentalize your life where Jesus is only allowed to be in on certain parts, and then you've got to push him out and ask him to stay in the guest room for the rest. Are you here today? Then you've got a problem. That's not a Christ-centered life. We got to make sure that Jesus is at the center of every decision that we make personally. We got to make sure Jesus is at the center of every decision we make as a church. We want to make sure that he is being glorified in us because I want to tell you something. We are the most satisfied in him when he is the most glorified in us. We are the most satisfied in him when he is the most glorified in us. That's how we know that we are living Jesus-centered life and, uh, lives and Christ-centered lives. And then last of all, it says, by building a large Christ-centered church and transforming culture through creativity. So what does that really mean? Transforming culture through creativity. Well, first of all, don't write yourself off here because I've heard people say, well, I've heard the statement before through creativity. And I just, I feel like that's, you know, doesn't really include me. I'm, I'm in the business arena. Really? You don't need a creativity in business? Uh, well, I'm just a, you know, I'm a family person. I'm, I don't even really work. I just spend time. You don't need creativity in your family? Really? I mean, it takes creativity for me to be able to communicate with my eight-year-old daughter. Uh, you need creativity in life. You need, what is creativity? It, the Bible says in the beginning, God what? Created the heavens and the earth. One of the primary attributes of God is his creativity. It's the ability to speak something into nothing, to create something. We, who believes that we need God ideas in every area of our life? Transforming culture through creativity. What if we believed that this room is filled with people, that Cypress Creek High School and City of Life South Orlando, that room is filled with people who have the ability to have God-given creative ideas that are meant to transform Osceola in Orange County. What if we believe that? That God can give us ideas that will literally change the world, change and transform a broken culture. Yeah. Our culture is whack. It is broken. You say, well, what do you, okay, I'm, I'm gonna explain it. I'm gonna give me some time, guys. It's messed up. Here's why. We live in a post-Christian culture in America. What does that mean? It means that for years and years, Christianity was truly the foundation of our country. We're talking about for hundreds of years. Christianity was the undercurrent of America. We made our decisions. We did things based on those values and those ethics that were derived from the Christian faith. Okay, so we have gotten to a point now where secularism has taken over to a degree where Christianity has become an afterthought. But here's the problem is culture has cherry picked Christian principles they have taken Christian principles, things like caring for the poor, things like standing up for the marginalized. Those are Christian values and Christian principles that were found in the Bible originally. But what's happened is culture has cherry picked the things that they like from Christianity and taken them and formed some weird twisted version of individualism where they've adapted it to themselves. They've X Jesus out of the equation. They've X God out of the equation. They've X the Holy Spirit out of the equation. They've X the local church out of the equation, but they're holding on to these things and they're preaching, you better do this, you better do that, but we don't want anything to do with God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, church, the Bible. Yeah. So now what you have is a culture that is the most judgmental culture in the world that tells you don't judge anyone. You ever notice that? They judge everyone, but you can't judge anyone. Not even based on the Bible, because according to culture, the Bible is nothing but a hate-filled book. Well, I encourage anyone who believes that to actually read it because it's a book about life. It's a, it's a book about hope. It's a, it's a book about a second chance. Don't, don't, read, don't read those headlines and believe that. 
It's a book about a love story. It's about God coming and rescuing a broken down world and a broken down race of people. Humanity is the race of people that can't save themselves. And Jesus saying, I have to become one of them. And I have to die and take their place in order that by believing in me, I can redeem them. And I'm, I'm not trying to oversimplify, but if you really want to know what it is in, in a snapshot, then he lives this beautiful life on earth, encouraging people to love one another, to trust God, to raise the standards for what religion has always taught us in terms of don't make it just rules and regulations, but make it a heart change. Love one another as I have loved you. Follow after me. Let your life look after me. Then he goes back and gives us the person of the Holy Spirit to empower us. That's not hate filled. That's life. That's hope. Okay. And our culture has, as I said, they've cherry picked these principles, but, but they've lost, it's lost the power because Jesus is the power. You can have the form, but, it, but if, you, if you deny the power there, thereof, you've lost everything that makes it valuable. You can have the actions, but if you don't have the power behind it, you're missing the very thing that makes it worth anything. And, and the name of Jesus is the thing that can change and transform this world. And we want to transform culture, this broken down culture. We want to transform it through creative ideas, ways to reach people, ways to present hope that are unique, that are compelling. I think media is involved in that. I think the arts are involved with that. But I also think in the, in the business world, in, in social aspects, with conversations that we have, God giving us creativity on how to talk to our neighbors, how to talk to our friends. You know, the, the, the Christian church that we talked about that grew so huge, they were under Roman rule. And when Jesus died in 33 AD, shortly after that in 44 AD, uh, the first apostle died. To, to Herod by the sword. And then shortly after that, Christians as a whole, I mean, the other apostles started going pretty quick. I think John died around 90 AD. He wasn't uh, martyred. He's the only apostle that wasn't martyred. But we started seeing after that for the next 300 years, Christians being persecuted and killed and executed because of their faith. They, were, they realized that the threat of Christianity growing and spreading it was going to destroy their empire if people really started believing. So they made it illegal. Did you know that just in a short amount of time, just a few years later, after it became totally illegal, that in 380 AD, the emperor got saved from Rome and he made Christianity the official religion of Rome. So just in that short amount of time, have you ever thought about the fact that in Catholicism, where is the Vatican? It's in Rome, it's in Italy. So the place where the Roman culture was that was against Christianity became the head of the Christian church. So the idea, and also what happened after that? We see through the dark ages and the middle ages, uh, Christianity and, and, and Christian thought influencing culture and affecting culture. When you see the Renaissance and the art of the Renaissance and Handel's Messiah and, and the, the Sistine Chapel and the Statue of David, these, these beautiful works of art and, and, and music and all these amazing things that are inspired by the Bible. Christianity has always affected culture when it's working correctly. We have come to a point where we have stopped affecting culture. And we've allowed a culture to start affecting us. So what is transforming culture through creativity? It's believing that God has given us something to say and that he's given us God ideas and ways to communicate it. You know, I love First Chronicles chapter 12, 32. This is such a cool, it's, it's just a very short thing, but I always think about it. It says, and the children of Issachar were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. How cool. The children of Issachar were men who had understanding of the times. Somebody say understanding of the times. I can't tell you how important that is. I grew up in a culture, church culture, where, you know, if someone walk, if you're a Christian and someone walked up to you at your job and said, how are you doing? You said, hallelujah, praise the Lord, feel the power of the Holy Ghost starting in my head. Oh, it's working its way down. I feel it just came out of my foot. You feel that? I mean, it's like, it's like they, do you know how you, it's like you're from Mars or something. It's like, what are we talking about here? 
But I understand that as Christians, that our conversation is different sometimes and, and, and you know that there should be a distinction about us. But it's not like we should be from a different planet. I mean, if you're a missionary and you go to a different country, if you wanna be an effective missionary, you have to learn the language, correct? And I like this, that the children of Issachar were people who understood the times. We have to be intuitive enough as Christians, effective Christians, to feel out what culture is going through. Research a little bit what people are going through. What is their background? What is their worldview? How can I connect with them? How can I have an understanding of the times to know what I ought to do the way the sons of Issachar and the children of Israel, Issachar understood the times and knew what to do for Israel? And I think that's really important for us as we move forward. I don't just want to transform culture through our videos and plays and you know, what's on our YouTube channel. That's that, you're, if you think that's what transforming culture through creativity is, you're missing it. I wanna transform culture through creativity by the actual church who is you going out into your community and God giving you ideas. Do you know how many future businesses are sitting in this room? Do you know how many future dreams? Do you know how, do you know how many future movies and hit songs that are gonna be on the radio someday and, and, and dancers and directors and, and politicians and, and preachers and pastors and chefs for me? You're gonna cook for me someday? <laughs> future chefs. I'm just trying to think of all the different, it's, I mean, it's extraordinary that if we believe in transforming culture through creativity, then you're gonna get a hold of this message. You're gonna say, God, I want that to start with me. When, that's when City of Light, see, Jesus first, Jesus always is Christ-centered, but me first, me always is me-centered. And the reason why we're Christ-centered is I don't wanna be City of Life first, City of Life always. It has to be Jesus first, Jesus always. It can't be Jeff first, Jeff always. It has to be Jesus first, Jesus always. So we have to make sure that he is at the center of everything we do as a church. And then that way, our vision statement makes sense to make the hope of Jesus known by building a large Christ-centered church, transforming culture through creativity. Can someone say amen today? Come on, let's give the Lord a great praise. This concludes the teaching. If you'd like to support what God is doing here at City of Life, click on the Give button at www.col.tv or text a dollar amount to the number 855-997-6900. We hope you'll join us again.